We're reading in Genesis 26 then again. Genesis 26, hopefully conclude the chapter. Well, we shall conclude the chapter, I trust, tonight. Genesis 26. And we're going to read from verse 23. Genesis 26 and verse 23. And he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him the same night, and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there, and called upon the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar, and Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, since ye, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace, thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. And they rose up betimes in the morning, and swear one to another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and said unto him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. And Esau was forty years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Okay, so we're continuing then with Isaac's experience among the Philistines. And uh, last week, you'll remember, we were looking at the wells and we, I uh, suggested some of the wells the Philistines are filled in and uh, how that we need to be redigging those and opening them up again and we're just going to conclude then the chapter tonight with this last visit of Abimelech to Isaac after he's moved away from Gerar back to uh, about what is later called Beersheba verse 24 and the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said I am the God of Abraham thy father Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. So Isaac could rest, as it were, in the promises of God to Abraham. Isaac could be comforted that God would be gracious regarding his personal failures, because Abraham was, in a sense, his advocate. God had assured Isaac that he was going to be blessed because of, of his father Abraham. And in exactly the same way Isaac would be blessed because of the faith of Abraham, so shall real Christians be blessed because of the faith of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, Paul teaches the church in Rome. Let me read you a couple of verses from uh, Romans chapter 8. Very comforting verses. Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? John also in his letter reminds us, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And again, in John's first letter, in chapter 2 and verse 12, he says, I write unto you, little children, because you, your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And so it's a wonderful thing, you know, to, to keep in mind that just as Abraham was blessed, sorry, Isaac was blessed because of God's promises to Abraham and because of Abraham's life and Abraham's faithfulness, so the church is blessed and the Christians are blessed because of the faith of Jesus Christ because of the affections of Jesus Christ and because of the offerings of Jesus Christ. Very comforting truth indeed. Well, Isaac is now back in Beersheba 
which we read in verse 23. He went up from thence to Beersheba. Now, if you look on a map, you'll see Beersheba is south of Gerar, but in all probability, the up is a reference to uh, height rather than uh, direction, uh, I suspect, because Beersheba is certainly south of Gerar. And we'll, we'll think a bit, of, well, Beersheba was apparently 30 miles or so east of Gerar and about 15 to 20 miles to the south. So when he went up, he clearly went up in terms of, of altitude. Now we learn from Genesis 21, verses 31 and 32, the story of Abraham and Abimelech, that Beersheba was not Philistine territory. So Isaac now has gone out of Philistine territory. And uh, we might therefore say that in Beersheba he has now separated himself from the Philistines and lo and behold they now come to him. Verse 26, then Abimelech went to him from Gerar and Ahuzak, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. Now the names Abimelech and Phicol are precisely the same names uh, we find of the individuals meeting Abraham in chapter 21 and verse 22 but we're about a hundred years later here um, so it's a possibility that these might be sons of those that former Abimelech and Phicol uh, or some of the commentators think it, it's uh, very likely that these were titles rather than names in the same sense that Pharaoh is a title Caesar is a title and so forth um, I've probably mentioned to you before you know those men that the king of Assyria sent when, when the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, was invading Lachish, and we saw the pictures on the wall, if you remember, those of you that came to the museum, uh, when Sennacherib was invading Lachish, he sent his servants to go and threaten Hezekiah. And the story's in a couple of places. Uh, I think it's in Second Kings, it's in the prophets of, of, of Isaiah, uh, and I can't remember their names, Rabshaki, uh, and so forth. Those also might be official titles but I won't press the point, but this, it's very possible that this is the case here because the names are exactly the same and about a hundred years have passed, so the, uh, the commentators tell me. Now, Isaac then has separated himself. He's not in the Philistine country anymore, and now they come to him. And we considered last week a little bit of the truth of separation. Uh, it's largely a forgotten doctrine these days in many churches. I think I said to you last week, that in the last church where I was, there was a brother there, very, very able preacher, very popular on the conference circuit among the brethren, uh, written a few commentaries and so forth, a lovely brother, very capable, and he said to me, I don't preach on separation because nobody wants to hear it. Well, my position is preach on it, and, you know, some of them, hopefully somebody will take some notice. But he said it was a, what somebody might call a lost cause these days. I wouldn't quite personally go that far but certainly it's a forgotten doctrine in many churches it's a well if you will that's been filled in by the philistines the importance of separation from the world and i think i might have said this last week but it bears repeating that those who have the least to do with the world have the most and the greatest effect upon it christians ought to be different and churches ought to be different might you please God to open those wells again we read last week therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation God give us a church where his wonderful presence is felt a church where the word of God is preached as thus saith the Lord when I was a young Christian I used to go to a Pentecostal church and uh, they used to have some fine preachers from time to time and one of the things they often used to pray, they always used to pray for the preachers. In the, the prayer meeting was on a Thursday. It was always well attended. The prayers were earnest. And they always prayed for the Sunday preachers. And they often used to say, let him preach as thus saith the Lord. And that's what we want in the church. We want a church where we're all hungering and thirsting, thirsting after righteousness. A church where pride is left at the door and Christ alone has all the glory. Sadly, many churches suffer, particularly if they've got more than one preacher, because the preachers start vying with one another, their pride swells, um, and it can cause real trouble in the churches. A, a plurality of elders, a, probably a correct brethren doctrine, but if those elders are not humble, it can be a real cause of trouble. I was amazed to hear from this same brother that I mentioned a moment ago in my last church. He was always on the conference platform for the brethren, and he used to speak with some, the, some of the big shots. And he told me some of the most remarkable stories about how they used to argue amongst themselves about who was going to preach first. These were big names in the Brethren movement. 
and they used to argue uh, who was going to preach first because quite, you know, you'd be top of the bill if you were last I guess so I'm not quite sure how they viewed it but I thought to myself what a shock, what a shame that these men who are supposed to be leaders in the church are so proud we want a church where the poor can hear the gospel where the broken hearted are healed where captives are delivered, where the spiritually blind receive their sight, where in short the Lord Jesus continues his ministry as he describes it in Luke chapter 4. God give us a church that fits us for times like these, where we receive weighty and satisfying teaching that we might triumph over all the strategy of the world, the flesh and the devil. Let's read on, verse 28, they said we saw certainly, this is Abimelech of course, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee and we said let there be now an oath betwixt us even betwixt us and thee and let us make a covenant with thee that thou wilt do us no hurt as we have not touched thee I was, I was interested to notice today this is Abimelech speaking or Abimelech and Phicol or Abimelech, Phicol and Huzzah for all I know because it says they said we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The end of verse 29, thou art now the blessed of the Lord. Again in capitals. When you find the Lord in capitals like that in your King James Bible, it's a translation of the word Jehovah. So here are Philistines who know the name of Jehovah. So that says to me, what have the Jehovah's Witnesses got to boast about? Even the Philistines knew what the Lord's name was. You know, you can, be, you can know God's name and still be an unsaved Philistine. You can, you can know God's name and be an unsaved Jehovah's Witness, or an unsaved Christadelphian, or an unsaved professing evangelical even. It, it's strongly likely that though they worshipped Dagon, the fish god, uh, which incidentally is where the Pope gets his hat from I've talked to you about that if you don't know about it but they worshipped Dagon the fish god um, they had learned about Jehovah most probably from Abraham and from Isaac it's also clear from these couple of verses we just read that they were afraid of Isaac so evident was his blessing the Lord's blessing upon him verse 29 let us verse, end of verse 28 sorry let us make a covenant with thee that thou will do us no hurt I think it was Bloody Mary it was unlikely to be uh, Elizabeth I I think it was Bloody Mary who said I fear nothing so much as the prayers of John Knox John Knox as you may know was a contemporary of Bloody Mary she reigned from 1555 to 1558 she put to death around 288 of the finest men of God in the country and women too uh, many uh, vicars and ministers and bishops she burned at the stake along with many uh, ordinary folk shall we say and uh, she was contemporary with the Scottish reformer John Knox and she said I fear nothing so much as the prayers of John Knox Lancelot Andrews was on the committee of the King James translation uh, he, was, uh, he learned apparently a new language every summer uh, he was a master of languages and it's reported that he used to pray for five hours a day and even King James used to watch his tongue when Lancelot Andrews was about. Did Kedalaoma back in, you ran about chapter 13, 14 thereabouts, you remember the kings of the east fought with the kings of, of, the, uh, of the area of Sodom and the kings of the east were led, were led by Kedalaoma. I wonder whether he and his confederate kings of the east had reason to be afraid of Abraham, they certainly did because Abraham with his 317 servants took on all those kings and slew them so I repeat what I said last week the quote or was it the week before from Clarence London moral power excels so they say let there be an oath betwixt us and thee now it seems to me Isaac was doing nothing wrong by, by such a covenant as he was only promising peace uh, if you have some doubts about that I'd be happy to hear them afterwards but it seems to me that Isaac did nothing wrong here in agreeing to this covenant because all he was doing was promising not to fight with them and nevertheless we need to be very cautious about contracts with the ungodly John Phillips writes here the friendly outstretched hand of the world we must remember is stained with Jesus blood Matthew Henry remarks no bonds will hold ill nature and to use a Shakespearean phrase 
Beware of clapping hands in a bargain with the ungodly. The New Testament exhortation is, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now some limit that promise to marriage, but I think it applies much more broadly than that. It does apply to marriage, but it has a much broader application than that. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Any scheme or proposal uh, having an ungodly motive, we must not put our name to. Let's just have a look for a moment at Proverbs chapter 1. You might like to turn, because I'll read several verses. Proverbs chapter 1, it's up to you, however. I'd rather you didn't go to sleep. But uh, if you can read with me, that's good. I understand. There was a brother, you know, uh, this same guy that, uh, that was at uh, my last church. He told me about one of the brothers in the Brethren that used to say, if somebody fell asleep, he'd say, just let them have a few winks. That they might be fresher to hear me when they wake up. <laughs> Which is a gracious way of looking at it. Um, so Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance, we shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood, they lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. So the young man here has been exhorted to beware of his um, these enticements into, into agreements and into pacts and schemes and so forth. And uh, we need to be careful what we get involved with. Jehoshaphat, one of the good kings of Israel, erred at this very point in collaborating sorry the, he was a king of judah and he earned at this very point in collaborating with the wicked king of israel in a maritime venture and the bible tells us that the lord broke his ships the lord just wrecked the venture because he was he was teaming up with somebody that he ought not to be a teaming up with now i don't know about you personally you might have lots of time for the birmingham city mission i don't have much time for them because i learned years ago that they will do all sorts of stuff to keep the council happy because they get grants off the council I heard years ago that when the mayor came round to visit them one time, they took all the biblical texts down because they didn't upset the mayor of Birmingham. And you know, you don't get into bed with the council for the sake of money, if you'll, if you'll pardon that somewhat vulgar expression. We need to be careful who we associate with. He who pays the piper calls the tune. And once you're beholden to the ungodly, they can persuade you to do all sorts of things that you ought not to do. In proof of the hollowness of, of worldly promises, the same covenant as this was made with Abraham and the Philistines broke it. In Genesis 21, the Philistines made a covenant with Abraham specifically that the well at Beersheba was Abraham's. Uh, and it appears uh, that, that that too had been taken because Isaac here redigs it. If you're wise in these wicked times, you'll hold your cards very close to your chest, much less enter into unnecessary bargains with the world. Lying in our generation is commonplace. The Jesuits and the Muslims have a doctrine which allows them to lie. The idea is that in their eyes, non-Catholics or non-Muslims, because they are considered second class people at best, can be lied to. You can lie to those worthless heathen, such as us. The Jesuits call it mental reserve. They used to use it in the days of the Oxford movement. Um, and the Muslims have a title for it as well. I think it's called Takia, but I'm not altogether sure. But there's this idea that you can lie to the, the, to the, the Goyim, you can lie to the dogs, you can lie to the Protestants because they're not, uh, they're not decent people. Micah 7, chapter 2, book of the prophet Micah. I'm still not really quick at finding the minor prophets after all these years chapter 7 just a few verses from here I think these principally apply to the tribulation but it's a very plausible warning I think for our own time Micah 7 verse 2 the good man is perished out of the earth and there is none upright among men they all lie in wait for blood 
They hunt every man his brother with a net, that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh and the judge asketh for a reward, and the great man he uttereth in mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. The best of them is as a briar, the most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchmen and thy visitation cometh, now shall be their perplexity. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a guide, keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoureth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore I will look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. I think there's a lot there that would apply to our days, and I was, I'm often struck by this warning in verse 5, trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a guide. We need to be very careful these days who we share uh, precious things with. You know, one of the kings, was it Hezekiah? It was Hezekiah, made the mistake uh, where after he'd been ill, now I, if my math is correct and I remember rightly, you know Hezekiah was sick and the Bible and the Lord says to him, set thine house in order for they shall not live but shall die. I believe Hezekiah was only 38 and the Bible says he wept sore um, and then the Lord gives him 15 more years and then after he's healed we read that the Babylonians sent some ambassadors uh, to, to see uh, Hezekiah having heard that he'd been sick and we read that Hezekiah showed him all the treasures of his house these kind gentlemen that had come to, to see him from Babylon he showed him all the treasures well I'm pretty sure word got back to Nebuchadnezzar or his father uh, that there's plenty of gold in Jerusalem and of course when they did come the city was sacked and all the all the goods were taken uh, and of course Isaiah whether it's a rebuke it's hard to say but I, sus I suspect there's an element of rebuke there Isaiah tells Hezekiah have you shown all these things to the ambassadors from Babylon all of this shall be taken away and of course it was and we need to be careful who we share we are people just put everything out on the internet these days all their private business pictures of the children everything on facebook is madness it's absolute madness we learn we need to learn a little bit of privacy particularly when we're involved in the work of the lord we might just be giving away things that the lord wants us to keep quiet about hezekiah did it it's very probable of course I don't know but it's very probable that the Babylonians would have come anyway but no doubt the knowledge of all that money might have sped the trip up a little bit verse 30 then reading on we read that Isaac he says and he made them a feast and they did eat and drink what does the Apostle Paul say in Romans chapter 12 let's just have a quick read there I'll turn there Romans chapter 12 Paul says this you think Isaac had read it Verse 20, Romans 12, Therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now that's exactly, of course, what Isaac did. You remember maybe the story of Elisha the prophet, when the Syrians came out to take him captive. He smote them with blindness, and he took them into Samaria. And the king said, Shall I smite? Shall I? And, and, and Elisha said, Feed them and send them home. And that's exactly what they did. They fed their enemies. And then the same verse it says there uh, that they came no more the bands came no more uh, into israel verse 32 and it came to pass the same day that isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged and said unto him we have found water the same day that isaac is kind the same day that isaac feeds these men and sends them away in peace the same day a well is discovered god blesses him uh, for his conduct so we come now to a slight change of subject verses 34 35 we're looking at Esau Isaac's son you remember Isaac had two sons Isaac and Rebekah Jacob and Esau and uh, Esau was to turn out to be a real enemy of the people of God but here we read about him in verse 34 Esau was 40 years old and when he took sorry when he took to wife Judith the daughter of Beri the Hittite and Bashamath the daughter of Elon the Hittite which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to 
Rebecca. So now we have an unequal yoke again. But this really is an unequal yoke. Whereas I can't personally see, and again, you're welcome to challenge me afterwards, I don't personally see any problem with the covenant that Isaac made with the Philistines. You know, if, if well, I was going to say if he got any sense, I'm sure he had. You know, you'd take all those covenants with a pinch of salt. But here was a covenant that should not have been made. It was a, it was a marriage contract uh, that Esau should never have entered into. Now, if you're in the habit of listening to uh, preachers on YouTube, as some of us are, you listen to preachers from down south, you might find that some of them say the problem here was these women were black. And they still preach that in some of the churches down south, that that was why, that was why Isaac and Rebecca were grieved, because um, these two women were black, coming from that part of the world. I don't think that's why Isaac and Rebecca were grieved. It was not their colour, but their culture that was offensive to Abraham and Isaac. Anybody, uh, anyone today who objects to godless or idolatrous foreign culture is called a racist. And this is why we've had all this furore over coming out of the, um, ostensibly anyway, coming, whether it'll happen, we'll have to wait and see, coming out of Europe. Uh, it's all construed to be racism. Um, but those of us, some of us anyway, at least that voted for Brexit, are concerned about the destruction of the culture, the destruction of the remains of Christianity by a massive influx of Muslims, not because they're dark skinned, but because they worship Allah and because wherever they prevail, they persecute Christians. That's a cause for concern. It's got nothing to do with it. But they'll say to you, you're a racist. And so they say here, you know, the problem was with, with uh, Isaac and Rebecca that they were racist. I don't think that was the case for a moment. The New World Order program is going on and it must encourage immigration because it destroys a sense of national identity and culture and in particular Christianity. Now I often watch a, a um, what would you call it, an alternative news program during the week, some of you know what I'm talking about, and even on there, these guys are not Christians, and even on there they've said, why is it it seems that it's always Christianity that's the target? Even, or even unbelievers can see that Christians are being marginalised and picked upon. The word of God is absolutely clear that nations and natural borders are national borders, sorry, are ordained of God. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Isaac and Rebecca were grieved because these were pagan, godless women. They were Canaanites whom Esau took in defiance of his upbringing. And sadly, even in the best of homes, even in the godliest of homes, children may turn away from God just as Samuel's children did. It's the father's responsibility principally, not the mother's, the father's principally to raise his children in the fear of the Lord. He's supposed to be the head of the house. If the wife's with him, so much the better. But it's principally the father's responsibility. Nevertheless, even if the father fulfills his responsibility, children can sometimes still be wayward. I mean, Samuel is a classic example of this. Samuel, a fine, godly Old Testament prophet, and yet we find that his sons could be bribed. And his sons were not trusted the way he was. Eli, the priest, was a man of God. He was a man who had a great concern for the ark, but he never disciplined his sons. And here were two boys that grew up uh, in, 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 the, in the home of the high priest, and they were wicked in the extreme, and God destroyed them on the battlefield. So we have here then these two women that, that Esau marries. Judith, the daughter of Beerah the Hittite, verse 34, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. But if we go to chapter 36, we'll find they have different names. Chapter 36 of Genesis. And verse 2. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Bashamath, Ishmael's, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. Now, I don't think the Bashamath here is the Bashamath that's mentioned um, in chapter 26 of Genesis. Uh, but here, you know, this kind of thing is just where the atheist loves to land and say, there you go. In fact, I saw it today on, on YouTube. Uh, 
you know, I don't know what the site was called, something like the Bible's full of errors, the site was called, something like that. And they love a spot like this because they say, aha, you see, the Bible can contradicts itself. Well, for people as dumb as that, it's hardly surprising that those are the kinds of things they say. And, you know, the atheist finds a place of rejoicing here because he thinks he's found an error and he makes a YouTube video to mock the Bible. But the answer is easy. The first name of the female was frequently changed at marriage. Uh, just as today we change the surname. In those days it was frequent to change the name of the female. Furthermore, Bible characters are often called by more than one name. Look at verse 1 here. Now these are the generations Esau, who is Eden. So he's got two names. Um, his land also is referred to as the land of Seir, S-E-I-R. Moses' father-in-law is called Jethro, and he's also called Ruel. Jerusalem, in one of the prophets, is called Ariel. I think it's Isaiah. Judah and Israel, or it's probably Jerusalem and Samaria, in uh, Ezekiel 23, are called Ahola and Aholiba. So it's, it's not uncommon for people to have more than one name. Jacob is called Israel. Simon is called Peter. And I'm sure if I took some time over it, I could give you a great long list that, that we accept. That It's obvious that you know, these are different names for the same people. But in comparing these two places, chapter 26 and chapter 36, it appears that Judith in chapter 26 is a Holibama here in verse 2. And Bashamath in chapter 26 is Ada here in verse 36. Now the, the commentators seem to disagree which were the former and which were the latter names. But John Phillips gives some credible reasons for why chapter 36, Ada and Aholibama were the former names. Chapter 36 verse 2, let's just look at that again. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. Um, Esau took wives of the daughters of Canaan, then Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. But we have met with an Ada before. A-D-A-H, not Ada, like it is in England these days. But we have met with an Ada before. Isaac would probably aware, be aware of his family history, though Esau might not have cared much for it. But if you look with me to Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4 and we find an Ada here verse 19 and Lamech took unto him two wives the name of the one was Ada and the name of the other Zillah and then verse 23 and Lamech said unto his wives Ada and Zillah hear my voice ye wives of Lamech hearken unto my speech for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Lamech was a shameless killer and a polygamist. I think I'm right in saying he's the first polygamist mentioned in the Bible. Um, I, please don't think I'm insulting your intelligence, but if you don't know what a polygamist is, it's somebody that marries more than one wife. A bigamist, strictly speaking, will be two, but we, once it gets over that, or even two is considered as polygamy. Um, now here was the first polygamist and his wife was called Ada, the same as Esau's. Uh, Lamech, as I say, was the first polygamist. He took two wives. Abraham had one wife, Sarah. Isaac had one wife, Rebekah. Adam had one wife, Eve. But Esau takes at least three wives. He was a polygamist. And just like Lamech, he marries a woman called Ada. Now it might have been, as Philip suggests, it might have been Isaac who changed Ada uh, to Bashamath because of associations. I wonder how you'd feel uh, if your son, having recently got married, and uh, I wonder how Paul would have felt if uh, you know they'd produced the baby and Paul said, uh, it's a lovely little girl, what are you going to call her? And Matt said, we thought we'd call her Jezebel. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder how Paul would have felt, I wonder how I would have felt about it, you know. You'd say, oh, well, you wouldn't call, I wouldn't call her Jezebel if you're my granddaughter, I'd think of something else. Or how about if, you, if you, you had a grandchild and they wanted to call it Bacchus? I don't think I'd agree with that either. And I, I suspect it might have been, I don't say for sure, but just a possibility that these names were changed by, uh, by Isaac. Now the other, the other woman here mentioned in chapter 36 and verse uh, 2 is a Holibama. Uh, and Holibama was Judith in chapter 26. 
Uh, now, I suspect it's not an unre unreasonable conjecture that she may have well have been a temple prostitute in Canaan. Her name means Tent of the High Place. Now, High Place is throughout the King James Bible. Whatever they're called in modern Bibles is anybody's guess. But High Place is throughout the King James Bible were places of idolatry. And her name means Tent of the High Place. There's a connection there with idolatry. And along with the idolatry in those places was fornication and all sorts of gross indecency that actually accompanied the so-called the so worship. Um, and fornication was part of that. So it is today in Satan's meetings to this very day. I fear along with ritual slaughter and the drinking of blood. I have a, some tapes at home of a guy that used to work for the FBI. Uh, he was one of the, the head honchos at the FBI and he said Satan, Satanism, was, Satanism was being practiced all over America when he was editing the FBI including killings and the drinking of blood. Believe that if you like, it's up to you. Isaac again would not want the tent of the high place in his family and it may have been he therefore called a Bashima. But there is a very important lesson for Christians here. And we come back to that text in 1 Corinthians, I think it's round about chapter 6. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It means that Christians are forbidden to marry unbelievers. Many Christian girls now struggle to find believing men, in this country at least, because so many young men think that Christianity is for idiots and sissies. The truth of the matter is they themselves are not very bright and they're certainly cowards. It takes a little bit of courage to stand up and name the name of Jesus in this country. And the reason the young men won't do it, though they will tell you otherwise, is because they're afraid to stand up and be counted. That was certainly true of me before I was a Christian, till the Lord brought me so low I got no choice but to believe. And sadly, you know, and strange to say, believe it or not, I've met Muslim girls that are running into the same problem. Um, you know, although Muslims are having children by the thousand in this country, in, in, you know, Families of eight kids, five, eight kids, and nothing abnormal with the girls I teach. I say, have you got any brothers and sisters? They set me half on how to give me all their names, you know. Uh, but even some of the Muslim girls I talk to can't find husbands, which is a little odd. Um, but certainly it's difficult for Christian girls. Um, my daughter says, I, I hope this is, <laughs> what I can say, this is going out, might be going out on the internet, that, you know, by the time they get to her age, they're either stupid or married. <laughs> just, the, just the stupid ones that are left and the others are married. And I feel, you know, I know a number of Christian girls, Carrie's age, uh, and there are so few men around. But there's a danger. When professing Christians, girls can't find Christian husbands, they marry unbelievers. I've seen that happen. Because they want a husband at all costs. And the Lord doesn't appear to want to find them one, so they marry the nearest handsome Jimmy that comes down the road. It's madness and it's disastrous. Mm. Just the same as when a professing Christian man marries an unbelieving woman. It's madness and it's disastrous. They sometimes used to call it missionary dating mm. and it's foolishness. If she's not saved and you're a Christian, don't date her. That's right. If he's not saved and you're a Christian, don't date him. I was always my belief, certainly after I got saved, and I taught it to my kids, don't play, the, don't play the field. Look for a woman you want to marry. Don't just go out with every, look for a woman you want to marry. When you're going out with somebody, it would be with a view to marriage. And thank God that's what they did. To marry outside of the faith is to despise the cross. It's, it's serious. It's to despise the cross. A Christian marriage, on the other hand, is a wonderful thing. Uh, and strengthens the faith of both of those that are involved in it. It's a, it's, a, it's a lovely thing to be to have a Christian wife or a Christian husband. And it would be better to be single if you're a Christian girl or a Christian man. It's better to be single than to marry an unbeliever. It's disastrous to the faith. So we'll close there tonight. I've got a few points for prayer that one or two folks have said, would you pray for this and would you pray for that? So, In fact, just before I do that, can I mention the booklets? If you've not had this one, the three heavenly witnesses, I've got a few here, you're welcome to take one. I don't know if you know about 1 John 5, 7, first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's the strongest verse in the, in the New Testament for the Trinity. It's been taken out of almost all modern Bibles. It's been under vicious attack for centuries. This is the defence of that verse. If you want to take one, you're welcome. I've got a few. Um, 
I know some of you have already got one, but you're welcome to have one of these if you want. Now, some, one or two prayer points we've been specifically asked for. Andy Griffiths, uh, you, it's leukemia, isn't it? He's got leukemia in the bloodstream. And uh, it's, you know, he's got to be tested tomorrow and he's a little bit worried about that. So let's remember Andy uh, in our prayers that the Lord will just undertake for him. We were talking with Sean and Mimi on Friday and Mimi's very concerned about her home, her parents' home, that there might be an evil spirit there. Uh, they've got a shrine being Ch the Chinese, aren't they, Mimi? Is that right? They've got a shrine in the house that's ancestor worship going on. And Mimi's very troubled and her mother is having nightmares and all sorts of stuff and putting ginger under the pillow and, and you know, who knows what else. So pray for Mimi's parents. Pray that if there's something in the house, the Lord will deal with it. Can I mention a family called the Doherty's? I've told you about the Doherty's before. Uh, their son was approached by a paedophile, or rather the father was approached by a paedophile who said, I'll give you £25,000 for the boy. When they complained to the police, the police and the social services took their kids away, all four of them. They'd been hounded all over Ireland. They're, they're hiding from the authorities at the moment, the parents. Um, they passed all of the so-called, um, what do they call them? Uh, Investigation. Psychological testing. They passed all that. Um, so you might like to pray for them. It was very interesting on the program I was watching yesterday. They said, uh, if you could send a donation for the doctors, that'd be great. They received two and a half thousand pounds in two days, which is fantastic. And these, most for the most part, are unbelievers. So the doctor family got four kids. The kids have all been taken away. Um, they went to Ireland to get away from the Scottish authorities after them, and the Irish police took the kids away. And they've been trying to, you know, the authorities have been after them ever since. There were all sorts of problems. Can I ask you as well to pray for a lady called Serena? Uh, she's one of my pupils. I'm seeing her in the morning. She's got a test this month. Um, she's a Muslim, but she failed it about four times last year, not with me, I'm pleased to say, but she failed it once with me. She's spending a fortune trying to get through, and she's just a little bit ditzy, you know, sometimes that road mark is not quite right and she'll lose the plot. So if you could pray for Serena, because it means an awful lot to her. Uh, and one other thing, I, I spoke to Mrs. Curry, uh, Patrick's wife, or rather I didn't speak to her, I sent her a letter recently, uh, and she's asked for prayer, she's flying, she's 80, and she's flying to the USA to see the kids apparently sometime soon. So if you can remember the Andy Griffiths blood test, Mimi's situation uh, at her mum's house, dad's house, the Doherty's, Serena, my pupil, and Mrs. Curry. What I suggest is if there's anything that's particularly on your heart, bring it along on a bit of paper and then I could give that out, you know, next week. Okay, amen.